Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Marielle Villaray. I'm the Program Development Director for the Office of Academic Initiatives and Strategic Innovation here at the Graduate Center. And we are so pleased to be partnering once again with Copeland House on this series that we call Underscored, pairing conversations with artists and performances of pieces they've performed or composed uh, to be followed up with a live Q&A with you, our audience. So we really welcome your impressions and your questions, and you can submit those at any time throughout the program using the Q&A button at the bottom register of your Zoom window. I'm going to hand it off now to Michael Bariskin, who will tell us more about the music that we're hearing today from a composer, Viet Quang, who joined us at the Graduate Center in December 2020 uh, for our inaugural season, a program called A Listening Eye. And once again, we'll see the pairing of visual and uh, performing arts today. So please um, stay tuned for more and uh, please complete the survey at the end of today's program. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mario. And to our first time viewers, welcome. I'm Michael Boriskin, the Artistic and Executive Director of Copeland House, and I'm standing amidst the birds and trees on the terrace at Aaron Copeland's longtime home, a creative center for American music and a national historic landmark just north of New York City. And to our returning friends and viewers, welcome back. Today in our monthly virtual series called Underscored, showcasing important American works past and present, we're doing what we especially love to do, which is to spotlight a gifted young composer. And on this program, it's Viet Quang. Viet was born in California and raised in Georgia, where playing in his high school marching and concert bands inspired a great love of writing for wind instruments. He's a graduate of the Curtis Institute of Music, Princeton, and the Peabody Conservatory, and is now the California Symphony's composer in residence and a new faculty member at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas. Viet was also a 2014 fellow of our Cultivate Emerging Composers Institute, and the following year was a resident right here. In 2017, Copeland House awarded him its inaugural Harvest Commission, which recognizes one outstanding Cultivate Fellow each year. And it's that piece, Music from Copeland House, is about to perform shortly. It's called Fine Lines, which was inspired by Viet's strong interest in the visual arts, and in particular, his love of Picasso's famous ink drawings. So for now, I will just say that Viet's delectable piece is in six sections, each of which references one of Picasso's simple but really characterful drawings. There's a, a very graceful floating dove, an active and athletic grasshopper, a hard flying and maybe somewhat menacing sparrow, perhaps we have a few around here, and three energetic dancers. So after Music from Copeland House's performance, please stay with us for a live Q&A. But first, for our Harvest Commissions, we're so glad to acknowledge the inspiration and support of two great friends of Copeland House, Leslie Cecil and Creighton Michael. Regular viewers of this monthly series of ours know that we generally had our various featured composers uh, speak about the works of theirs that we're spotlighting or underscoring. Uh, but we thought we'd mix it up a bit for this program and hear from some of the performers who, like actors in new plays, are originating their individual roles. And we're really fortunate to be able to speak with two of Music from Copeland House's artists who you'll shortly see and hear perform Viet Quang's Fine Lines. Uh, and we have flutist Bum J. Kim and clarinetist Moran Katz. Um, Bum J, I thought we'd start with you because I know that you share with the composer a deep interest 
in the visual arts. Uh, you're a, a pretty accomplished photographer yourself and, uh, and a painter. Um, give us uh, your sense of this linkage between art and music, and in particular with, with Viet's piece, um, Picasso's iconic line drawings with this delectable uh, cycle that uh, Viet has written for us. Hello, first of all, thank you so much for having me today. Um, it's, uh, you know, when you, I, years ago, I stumbled upon uh, uh, videos of Picasso's um, line drawing that he was doing it on a um, um, transparent glass. And then on the other side of the glass, there was a camera filming Picasso's uh, very simple drawings and line drawings or with paint, uh, paint brushes. And I thought that the, um, it's just a line drawing, but it has so much action when you actually see Picasso doing it and it is very active and it is in a way very musical. And, uh, was playing um, Viet's piece that reminded me of uh, watching those videos of Picasso painting his own uh, line drawings and paintings. For, for sure. And in fact, the, the dancers' movements, plural, um, are kind of the core of this cycle um, because the image is of three dancers, uh, three women, and um, they're obviously dancing the same piece and they look very similar one to the next. Uh, they're standing side by side, but there's slight differences between among the three dancers as there are slight differences among the, the three dancer sections, right? Um, he makes a point of using the same uh, the same rhythms and kind of the same orchestration uh, amongst the ensemble, um, but the melodies and the harmonies are a little bit rejiggered. And so maybe Moran, I remember we were talking in one of the rehearsals um, about how, in a sense, this is the same piece three times, but they're different. And I remember thinking uh, at, at one of our rehearsals or maybe when we, yeah, one of our rehearsals that uh, you said, I think it was the last piece, boy, that's so complicated. Uh, that's the hardest of all for me. And I was thinking, oh, that's the easiest one for me. The first one is, is, uh, is the harder. And that in and of itself reflects reflects the, you know, the, the way the pieces have, have changed. Don't you think? I mean, tell, talk a little bit about these three pieces that are the same, but they're not the same. So I, I can't say anything about your part, Michael, but um, when I look at the three dancer movements, I, I have, I can explain exactly clarinetistically um, what's different. Uh, and they definitely get more and more complicated. And in fact, maybe the third one is a combination of the first two. Um, I definitely have more notes and more um, quarter tones, so I had to learn a new fingering for all these notes that are not traditional, um, that are between the half steps that we're used to. And I, I don't know that I've mastered it yet. <laughs> Maybe we can re-record it at some point. Um, but back to what you were saying before, um, I'm not a visual artist and I'm not a dancer, but it's kind of impossible not to dance as you're playing these. And um, I think I think if, if, if we were not during Corona times, we would probably get closer to each other and dance even more. <laughs> That's exactly exactly right. We are a little bit a little bit more more distance than than we normally would be. Um, and speaking of the virtuosity, really of all of the parts, um, your your big number is uh, for, with, with the clarinet featured is um, is the sparrow, right? And what is it that 
that, um, you know, what makes that so virtuosic? It's very brilliant, obviously, and it's nonstop, but, you know, tell us a little bit about what that sparrow is doing. I'll start, if that's okay, by showing you what my part looks like. Okay. Um, I barely have any wrists, and some might know that as a wind player, we highly appreciate the second to breathe. <laughs> Even if you're able to circle or breathe, it's still appreciated. So uh, kind of nonstop playing. Um, and as I mentioned before, a lot of those quarter notes that I had to practice and learn um, for this. And a lot of them are actually around the same note. So I can barely even hear the differences between the notes um, unless I really bring them out. So I could have F sharp and F quarter tone sharp and F natural. And they're all, if somebody were to sing them, you could barely even tell the difference. Uh, and even within the texture of everybody playing together, while I'm working really hard, I don't even think that all the notes can be clearly heard. Um, There's a lot I going on. Lot, I put a lot of work into that movement. And I mean, luckily for me, Viet plays clarinet. So it's not just random difficult lines, but he knew what he was doing. But it's still very virtuosic. Yeah, for sure, he, I, I gather, uh, that he has, well, he's spoken about his love for woodwinds. So I'm glad we have both both of our wind players here with us. Um, and he, I think that uh, came on him when he was playing in marching bands and, and uh, concert bands at high school. And so, yes, uh, he's got a, a real fondness for not only the mechanics of wind instruments, but the sounds uh, they, they make. Bumjay, the, I guess the big flute piece in this cycle is the dove. And that's one of Picasso's, uh, one of his most famous uh, images and that is so floating and, and gracious, but there are also a lot of notes there. Um, and so what, to talk to us a little bit about, about this musicalization of Picasso's Dove. Yeah, it, not just not just my part, your part as well. We um, trade a lot of moments together. Um, it's the hardest, thing for me was uh, to be able to sneak into your part and also hand off my part at the end of my phrase to you so we can have um, you know um, seamlessly connected line that's and then um, the most incredible thing about this movement is that uh, Viet uses um, same fingering but overblown harmonics within the phrase that kind of give me an i uh like a visual image of um a dove preparing to you know uh fly off <laughs> i think it's uh perfectly visually um um really intriguing uh visual moment it's very it's very evocative and amidst uh amidst this contributing to the sense of flight there are a number of places where the cello starts very, very high up in its range and swoops down. I think it's actually called a seagull effect. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because it creates that sense of, of a swooping bird um, and, you know, even something of the call of, of these birds. It's, uh, it's truly evocative. Uh, you, you allude to something which um, I think was very much in Viet's mind, which uh, in writing the piece, which is that he distributes uh, the melodic lines amongst the various instruments. Um, and he talked about this almost as a, as a game, uh, a kind of musical game of connect the dots, where one instrument would start a tune and another instrument would take it over. And maybe while that a second instrument had the melody, a third instrument might be just shadowing. 
a few of the lines. So it's really a, a pretty sophisticated mix of ensemble writing. And it all contributes to these really very vivid, very evocative pieces. And um, we're, we're thrilled that Viet wrote this wonderful piece for us. It's, it's entertaining, it's delectable. And uh, we, we've performed it a couple of times pre-COVID. Um, we're thrilled to be able to offer this performance. I have no doubt that we'll be playing this piece a lot. Uh, we're we're delighted to have it, and um, I'm so glad that we had the chance to to speak um, for a few minutes about the piece and set it up for our viewers. Uh, and we're going to hear music from Copeland House perform it now. But please stay with us uh, because we will be back right after the end of the performance with a live Q and A. And uh, we look forward to hearing your questions and comments uh, as always, and we look forward to trying to answer them. So enjoy the piece and we'll see you later. Thanks. Bye. 
Well, welcome back uh, to those of you uh, who are here and out there. Uh, while we're waiting for uh, all of you to uh, submit your questions, and you can do so by using the handy Q&A uh, feature at the bottom of your screens, um, I just want to mention that this program is being, pre is being recorded. And it will um, soon make its way to the Graduate Center uh, website and to a Copeland House playlist there so you can enjoy it again. Uh, I also wanted to uh, mention that you will be receiving um, a survey from the Graduate Center, which uh, we are always interested in getting your comments, um, not only in this Q&A, uh, but on the survey uh, as well, because it'll help us as we move forward out of, hopefully out of this uh, period of transition uh, back to something resembling um, normal life. Um, in any case, uh, for now, uh, it's such a delight to, to welcome our featured composer uh, today, Viet Quang. Um, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Um... Thanks again for this amazing performance. It's so good. Uh, thank you so much. Great to have you. Um, I understand, if I'm right, that um, you just completed your first full day um, of, of uh, being a faculty member at the University of Nevada at, at Las Vegas. Is that correct? This is your first day? Yes. <laughs> Terrific. How do you like it? Do you think you'll stay? Oh yeah, it's it's been great for the last uh, twelve hours. <laughs> um, terrific, terrific. The first twelve hours are, are always the hardest mm -hmm. in a job like this. Uh, in all seriousness, uh, music from Copeland House actually played um, at the uh, at UNLV um, not too long before the pandemic shot uh, shut everything down, uh, and we worked with some of the students there. We were there for a couple of days at, and a concert, and we had a wonderful time. It's a terrific place. Uh, there are a lot of uh, really creative people uh, there doing um, really good, solid work, and uh, I'm sure uh, I'm sure you'll have a, a wonderful time there. And uh, if I may say so, they are lucky to have you. Okay. Um, so uh, while we're waiting for uh, questions to start coming in, um, I actually want to throw out uh, a, a couple of questions. 
um, for starters, um, first of all, it may have seemed a little odd uh, for you to be sitting there while we're talking about you um, as if you're not around. And I just wanna make sure that we didn't get anything wrong about uh, what we uh, attributed to you uh, in terms of uh, kind of the origins and, the, and the, the background of the piece. I think you had everything correct. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, it's, uh, the piece was kind of inspired by, um, you know, these line drawings of Picasso, one of, the, one of them being the dove that um, my dad was such a big fan of, and he had this little print in the house growing up of it. And so um, I, I always, I kind of knew that I would write a piece about that one day. And so kind of uh, found other line drawings to include for other movements. Well, the dove is, is certainly one of Picasso's most iconic images, certainly. And uh, actually you anticipated a, a, a question uh, about that that I had, which is that, um, I mean, goodness knows, Picasso was so prolific in so many media. Um, and he really did a lot of line drawing. And I'm wondering, since there are so many images to choose from, how did, um, how did you, um, you know, how did you settle on the ones that you chose? The, the dove, the, the, as you mentioned, the grasshopper, the sparrow, and that one image of three dancers um, together, which you broke into three separate pieces. Yeah, well, like the dove, it's like I mentioned something I always wanted to be in, like to write a piece about, and then for the, the dancer movements, it was like nice to have a little variety in that, um, not just because it's not of animals, it's of humans, um, but also just how it has three subjects. And I thought it was really interesting how in that drawing, there are three dancers and they all look similar and they're all like kind of dancing the same to the same song, but have their own take on it. And so the three dancer movements in this piece are all like, kind of the same uh, rhythms and colors, but like the notes and the harmonies are all different. And each of the dancers is paired with an animal essentially. So uh, one of the dancers is paired with a dove and one of them is paired with the grasshopper. And for that one, in the sparrow movement, both the grasshopper and sparrow, I wanted to kind of let the instruments guide me to which drawing to use. Um, when I saw like the grasshopper, I immediately thought like, how about like cello pizzicato, like doing these boom, 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 like kind of like, like a grasshopper bouncing up and down. <laughs> and then the sparrow movement, um, I just kind of thought like, it looks kind of menacing, but also cute and like, uh, just kind of like try to capture that um, dichotomy in a movement. And so there's this like this, these clarinet chord tones that sound kind of kind of menacing, but also a little bit silly at the same time, and uh, kind of based that movement around the clarinet's quarter tones. So it's almost like the instruments in this ensemble guided me to which um, drawings to use. Yeah, and as we discussed in the, you know, in the intro beforehand, uh, the three dancer uh, sections are analogous to what you've just described of, of what Picasso did in the image where you have three dancers that look alike, but there are subtle differences among the three of them, just as there are differences among your three settings of the three dancer sections. So that was terrific. And I, I have to say, I, I especially appreciated that you did capture what I caught too in the, in the Picasso drawing of the, of the sparrow which does seem very cute, but there is something in the eye of the sparrow. And um, uh, yes, menacing indeed is exactly the word that, uh, that I thought about as well. Um, we got a question here from uh, Roger in New York, and uh, we have to get to this question because uh, Roger is not only a relative of Aaron Copeland, 
but he happens to sit on the Copeland House Board of Trustees. So we've got to take uh, Roger's question uh, directed to you, Viet. Um, he wanted you to speak about the influences. Uh, we've started to speak a little bit about this, the influences that you evoke in Sparrow and Dove. Yeah, well, the, the Dove, like I mentioned, was like a print that I had my parents had in their house like ever since I can remember and so for that one I kind of wanted to use like these simple chord progressions that I remember from like when I was a kid that I remember playing on the piano um you know for as long as I can remember and these chord progressions that I found have found beautiful my whole life um so kind of like references that and um the sparrow movement, um, in addition to those clarinet quarter tones, those kind of like cute but menacing quarter tones that Amaran played so wonderfully, because those are really hard, like she mentioned, she did an amazing job with them. Um, it kind of uses these chord progressions that are kind of like spooky, like Halloween <laughs> chord progressions, like almost like, like something from like Nightmare Before Christmas or um, sort of like Danny Elfman tinged chord progressions and I think of like Halloween as kind of that sort of, uh, you know, fun, but spooky, but can also be quite scary for some uh, kind of like a playfulness that's dark. Um, and so those are kind of the maybe harmonic influences in those movements. Mm -hmm. um, for sure. Roger also wants to know when we're going to record this piece. Um, and uh, the answer is, I hope very soon. Um, uh, we did commission the piece, uh, as I mentioned before we started, this uh, was our inaugural uh, harvest commission, um, which was an, in turn an outgrowth of our Cultivate Emerging Composers Institute. And uh, yeah, we're, we're thrilled to have this piece and uh, we played it a number of times. We will certainly play it again and we hope to, to get to record it as, as soon as, as, as we can. Um, there is a question here from Ariana, who um, asks you, considering that these pieces are so vivid musically, have you yourself ever tried drawing, either drawing or drawing your compositions? I'm not sure what she means by that, but um, have you have you done any? Because um, I know you love you love the visual arts. Have you done any drawing yourself? No, like that was kind of my first love <laughs> as a child. Like, um, well, I mentioned like my parents were fans of these like you know painters, especially my dad. And um, from like there wasn't just like the, there weren't just Picasso prints in the house. My dad really loved um, French impressionist painters, so we had these like very 80s lacquered like prints of, of you know, Renoir and Monet um, hanging around the house. And so I was like quite drawn to painting when I was a kid and like before music ever um, was something I was serious about. Um, I loved to like paint with watercolors and um, I loved oil pastels, I remember, and um, acrylic paints and things like that. So I guess I've always been uh, creative and wanting to make things. So uh, I guess it just ended up being music that I <laughs> uh, settled on. But um, yeah, I've never tried to like uh, draw or paint anything related to my own music. Um, that could uh, be dangerous. Yeah. Could I remember, I think I remember at uh, the Cultivate concert when I did Cultivate like years ago, maybe six or seven years ago now, there was an audience member who had like drawn things during the pieces. Yes. They like brought their sketchbook and had drawn uh, kind of sketches during the pieces, which I thought was really interesting. Very, yes, very cool. Well, I, you know, I have a um, kind of a follow-up question for, for that um, to take us beyond, beyond the visual arts. Um, one of the things that strikes me as I look down the list of, of pieces that you've written is um, 
how receptive you seem to be to outside influences, um, which I think bespeaks uh, a kind of um, curiosity um, and maybe openness to all kinds of things. I mean, I'm not gonna go down your entire works list, but um, you wrote a piece, actually the first piece that you wrote for us um, at Cultivate, uh, which was called Wax and Wire, where you tried to musicalize the contrast between, you know, oozy, uh, formless wax and taut, firm wire. Um, and I, you know, I, I was looking through your, your works list. I, I see you've got a piece that's either about or referencing renewable energy. Um, there's a, a piece that you wrote about a, 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 um, an experiment that a, a, a 17th century, century Jesuit uh, scholar wrote about with wine glasses and filling them not only to different heights of liquid, but to different kinds of liquid, which changes the sound of, uh, that a, a, a wine glass would make. Um, you got a piece called Pulse Train, which I think was a uh, uh, a phrase that uh, that your dad used in some some kind of a, a patent application description. So and that's only just a few pieces. So um, I don't mean to be glib if I say, where does your music come from? Um, from all of these various sources, how do you how do you uh, integrate them? How do you assimilate them and and translate them into a musical realm? Yeah, well, you know, I, I get asked a lot um, during Q and A's, um, like what inspires me? <laughs> and it's like always such a long question to answer, but kind of a short answer is like everything. Um, I think some composers, they like to, I don't know, maybe because they're trying to, um, to focus themselves, or maybe it's like good for their, you know, quote unquote brand or something to always be inspired by one particular thing. Like that's something that people know them for. But um, I always think that if you are to kind of limit your inspiration, you kind of limit yourself musically and you limit what um, kind of can excite you about writing music. So I always try to find inspiration in all sorts of things. Um, and Kind of when in terms of like musically translating those inspirations and things it just like really depends on what the pieces are <laughs> um like with this piece with fine lines it's like this idea of like these lines um kind of playing connect the dots between all the instruments and um like i have a piece called diamond tide that i wrote for middle school band that's inspired by like diamonds being melted so i was like what sounds like a diamond well something sparkly so like metallic percussion and then if you want to make it sound like it's melting you submerge it in water so it makes a pitch bending sound so it sounds like a diamond is being melted almost like <laughs> that and um so it just it really i just uh i have a lot of fun when i'm trying to um come up with like kind of ways to represent non-musical things with sound. Terrific. Well, look, I mean, you're at the, at the beginning of what I um, feel pretty strongly will be uh, an illustrious career. And this is certainly the time um, in, your, in your career, in your life, when you want to be you know, absorbing as much of what's going on in the world um, good and bad and everything in between as you can and, and making that a part of, uh, you know, of your, of your art and, and your work. And we are certainly uh, the, the better for it. Um, Music from Copeland House has now had two pieces from you. Um, and um, we, uh, you know, we, we look forward to uh, a, a long and, uh, and productive relationship with you and it's been a delight working with you and a delight playing the, this um this piece so thank you very much for both of those pieces oh thank you for bringing them to life uh it's always so been so nice to work with all of you and of course i was so honored to um spend a little time at copeland house and uh it's always uh very inspiring 
So thank you. And I want to say thank you to um, Creighton as well. I think I see Creighton in the uh, attendees list, so. Uh. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Uh, and you're referring to Creighton and uh, Michael and Les Leslie Cecil, who I mentioned yes. uh, in, in my welcome remarks. They are two great friends uh, and supporters and inspirations for us at, uh, at Copeland House. Um, and um, every, uh, every arts organization needs, uh, needs uh, wonderfully visionary and passionate people like that. So um, my hat's off to them as well. Thank you for mentioning them, Viet. Um, and um, we could go on for, for quite a while, but uh, I just wanted to say in closing that we've got um, several wonderful programs coming up uh, generally on the fourth Monday of every month. Um, and the three programs that we've got uh, coming up um, that will uh, take us to the end of this year uh, really just give a small, small hint of the breadth and diversity of um, music to be found in, uh, in America, past and present. Um, on September 27th, our next concert, um, we will be featuring a major work by uh, the Pulitzer Prize winning composer John Harbison, who we've featured before in this series. Um, he is one of our most formidable and distinguished uh, composers. On uh, October 25th, um, we will be turning the calendar back a bit to William Grant Still, who wrote a wonderful piece for violin and piano back in the 1940s that was inspired by uh, three sculptures by Harlem Renaissance um, artists, visual artists. And on December 6th, which is not a fourth Monday because of the holidays and the quirky calendar as we get to the end of the year, December 6th, we will be featuring uh, a wonderful work about uh, life and art in Peru, uh, Gabriela Lina Frank. And um, as I say, that's a, a tiny hint of the, uh, the enormous variety and, and color uh, of music in this country, past and present. We hope you will all join us. Um, Viet, thanks again for the wonderful piece. Thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.